Welcome here today. I'm really happy to be here today to be in this workshop. Um, we are giving a brief introduction before going to work uh, on why we are here and why we are leading this workshop today. We are uh, an organization, a non-profit organization called Invasion Digitali, Digital Invasions, uh, made by people who want to support and promote our cultural heritage and make it more open and more social. Um, every country, cultural heritage represents a big resource. Um, but in the last few years, many cultural organizations were suffering about budget cuts. And some of them with no budget at all, sadly. So, on the other hand, we have had many tools to reach a huge number of people. We're talking about web and social networks. So we have found a way to connect those people to the cultural organization. And we are going to explain you how. And that's a big deal because many cultural organizations uh, are approaching their audiences um, like they were going to do in the 1980s. They are considering visitors like the visitors who are visiting, who are visiting the museums and the historical centers and the travel destinations as in the 1980s, but we are in 2015. So the way we have to communicate to those people is really different. And why not? We have to make our visitors, our returning visitors, our audience, and our, why not, donors. So, uh, Invasion Digital is mobs of people who literally invade museums, historical centers, and um, cultural sites, archaeological sites, uh, telling their personal stories about those places through the web and social network. And we are here today, I'm the co-founder of Invasion Digital, and Barbara is our public relations uh, manager, <laughs> international, <laughs> international public relations manager, and um, I, after uh, secondary school based on mnemonics, I completed my uh, pharmacy degree. Don't ask me why, but I did it, and perfectly knowing that uh, my future uh, will be in a laboratory, but not in a chemical one. And uh, I'm now practicing uh, my patience. I'm really curious about social media and the web. In the last few years, my research were focused on social media, on the possibility of social media and the web uh, to help cultural organizations, travel organizations uh, connect to their audiences. That's why we're here today. And Barbara, let's. Uh, I'm a consultant in innovation applied to tourism and cultural tourism. Um, I have a very diverse background, a legal background, then I switched to uh, marketing and destination management, uh, more specifically. Uh, I both have international uh, experience, so I worked also abroad in the Netherlands, the UK, and South America for a while. And uh, at the moment, I'm working mainly on major uh, innovation uh, events. In innovation events, which are meant to be um, kind of uh, educational events, to so try to disseminate innovation culture in uh, within the country. Um, oh, no, well, that's good. That's good. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. And uh, as Mariana said, the University of Digital Crew, I'm the one looking after the international developments. So I'm, I'm keeping track of the international events and, and, and partnership, potential partnership with my own. Um, uh, and um, well, actually, I'm very proud to be part of the team. Uh, I came on board as an invader, uh, as an invader. Um, Myself, as an inventor myself, and it was really fun. And, and then you know, I, I really got the potential immediately of such a project. And there was so much behind it, such a great uh, prospects in terms of development and further development. Uh, I was really amazed, but I wasn't surprised that just for the first edition, I think something like 15,000 people joined, and the second, the second edition was probably doubled, 25, 25. So it was kind of you know, like an impressive. Uh, um, no, impressive figures without investing not even one cent on it. Oh, my, actually, uh, you, you invest yourself, which can be can count as a cost. So I was investing, but still, 
uh, you know, there is no funding. It's time, it's com competences, it's skills, and it's resources. But still, there was no additional investment from outside, not no uh, monetary funds from foreign source. And that says a lot about people and, and the will they have and the, the, the eagerness they, they, they boast to, to do something for themselves and for the place they live in. And I think that's a great potential still, uh, not fully uh, disclaimed about the uh, digital innovations. Okay. So, um, as I said, we are here today because we want to explain how a creative project, a creative idea could work. So, the first question is, do we born creative? Or can we have creative ideas even if we don't consider us creative people? Creative people invent things, or can we just invent a new way of experiencing things? Uh, do you have to invent a revolutionary startup to be a creative people? Or can we just invent a new um, way of simplifying an existing process? Uh, a new way of experiencing uh, a place, a museum, a cultural site. Uh, that's the idea based on um, of, of the workshop that we're reading today. We want to 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 free your creative uh, soul. So we want you to uh, to make a creative project, a creative. Um, uh, idea. Uh, for example, during the digital innovations, we have had a lot of different um, stories told, but some people just um, saw the cultural event that they were living in a different way. They reenact a picture, uh, painting of Caravaggio. So, can we invent it like a revolutionary things or a uh, up a website or anything else, but they just told the story of the painting in a different way. And one that I like a lot is uh, the experience of the people the Essex Museum. They uh, had uh, a show called uh, Impressionists of the Water, so a very traditional matter, Impressionists. They told that it would have been great to um, solve this show on a different perspective. So they um, they told how it would have been to be with an impressionist painter on the boat. Do you know that impressionists were used to live on the floating studios? They live there. So your point of view on a boat should be uh, really uh, lower than the normal. Well, on a, on a yacht. The big gate uh, on a boat, you know, so it's really on this way. So, uh, from a marketing perspective, they recreate a one to one reconstruction of a floating studio, starting from a drawing. So, they tell, you know, the, the, the um, newborn of, the, of a creative idea how it would have been to see the, the, the show. The exhibition on a different way. And they will create a one to one record shop and they put a painter inside the film yeah. studio. Just to show. A live painter. painter. Was it a live painter? A live, yeah, 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 yeah a live painter. So, the studio they have recreated is this one. So, um, they didn't invent much. You know? They just. Um, Enhance the engagement of people <coughs> during the exhibition. That's the idea. May I yeah. just uh, catch up for a second? They didn't invent, they made something yeah. physically. And that's a concept that's going to come back later on. So stick to your mind making something, okay? like building up, prototyping, in that sense. And an, an, another really, you can, you, can, you can just make questions during. Our talk, if you want. <laughs> so, more, more interesting if you just have a question and you just want to uh, make a question during, during our talk. And another really easy way to be creative in a museum in Luxembourg 
If you don't have time to visit the museum the day that you come, just come another time for free. So it's really, you know, it's really easy. It's not a really revolutionary thing to, to leave the museum. You know? But it's really useful. I would do that. You know? I don't like to Let's be honest. People oh, visiting the city are going to stay for a few days. So they are not coming back for the second time for free. So you're just engaging them without wasting any money, which is really smart, I think. And maybe I want, I want to go back because, you know, during an holiday, you know, so you did engage the audience, but you didn't, you know, spend a lot. And uh, so the process of making creative project, it's not, I'm a cat, I'm creative, I'm a genius, I got an idea. You have to train yourself to be creative. And sometimes you just found really a lot of excuses to, you know, to, uh, to cover up failures because we say, I don't have time, uh, I'm too tired, I haven't finished my work A or B or etc. And I fear failing, you know, but often all those excuses is just because we are distracted. We have, you know, a telephone and we have calls and we have a coffee break and we have friends and we have uh, our grandfather to, you know, <laughs> bring to somewhere. But um, we just have to know that fail is not bad. And fall is not bad. I used to fail a lot. And yeah, that's it. And fall is not so bad. I'm used to riding a motorbike. And uh, every time I go out, I try to find dangerous roads to ride. Because I need to understand, I need to know that riding on pebbles is dangerous. But I need to know how to ride on pebbles. Just to train myself that I can fall and die first. A lot of times, <laughs> but but I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot, and um, and I had fun because it's one of my patients. First of all, when you're starting a new project, you have to have fun. It's really important. And how you can, how you can do? Just study one of your passions in your job. I would used to run a hotel in Luca, and in the first days of my management. I was thinking uh, on how to promote the hotel, avoiding those old stories about the three, four, two nights, three, or uh, you know, big deal, big offer, just you know, uh, breakfast free, etc. Uh, one of my questions is jazz music, so I told them it would be uh, it would have been great to add my passion to my job. So I organized some jazz concerts at the hotel, and it was a great success. Even some famous jazz magazines uh, told about the jazz hotel. It became a jazz hotel. Because so of the very famous jazz musicians, as yeah. uh, And not because of me. <laughs> <laughs> so, being creative, it's really adding your passion to your job. Because it's easier, you know, if you have fun. It's easier to, to start a new project. May I say what happened this morning when I, when I checked out? Sure. I slept in the hotel. Sure. And this morning I went to check out and then the key to the, to the uh, checking desk, to the reception desk. And then uh, the, the girl asked me, are you leaving me just the key or are you leaving the hotel? I said, no, I'm checking out. And she was like, oh, such a pity. Mm -hmm. like, uh, that's engaging. I mean, she doesn't know me. And she did react in a very spontaneous way. I mean, she wasn't even like, uh, okay, you know, it's something I say in order to hang on uh, my work. I was like, oh, such a pity. And then and, and she was gone. And, and it was such a, a nice thing to say to, I guess, just spend that probably eight hours, you know, that's it. I just left that. I just left that and had breakfast this morning. But I think that was really cool. And I think that's uh, also an expression of what you're being capable to build in, in, within the staff as well. Because actually, they're fun uh, working on in that project, in the entire project. 
and they can perceive it. That, that's the kind of perception people have to receive from what you do uh, when you spend, when you passion what to do. That, that's the kind of feedback that they are supposed to receive. And, um, so, uh, the important thing is that you have to, um, to finish the work that you are doing before starting the project. I know that it seems pretty obvious, but it's not. You have to remove the stress about all the world works. And then you have to read a lot. Read as much as you can, every time as you can, and to, to know what's going on around you. Not just in your area of interest. If you're working in a museum, don't just read articles and blog posts and etc. about museums. Because it's really you know, important to know what's going on outside of you. Have you ever um, heard about real-time marketing? No? When some, something happens in, in sports, or in politics, politic, or in, you know, also in, in gossip, when you're talking about gossip, uh, big brands, like, um, create a marketing campaign the same day that it happened. Like, uh, the, the chairs, beers, uh, remember something? If you don't follow the chairs, uh, beer, Facebook page, please do. So they're just amazing. That's the best we are market there on the market at the moment. So just amazing. For example, they can teach you a lot. We are we are leading this workshop today, and at a certain time I, I fell down from the stage. I'm nice. doing something ridiculous. Okay, uh, maybe it will happen. And and Barbara that is actually the marketing manager of a big, big company, just create instantly uh, a marketing campaign about ad brands on the fact that I'm, I, I, I felt from the stage. Like, man, making, so making me ridiculous yeah. more than... Uh, making fun of you and making, making fun, having fun together with you. Oh, you're so nice. So, <laughs> we have um, a lot of tools that we can use on the web. I'm going, I'm going quickly because I want to uh, to write to the workshop thing. And uh, we have food suite. Do you know it? Uh, we have polls and we have newsletter, etc. Netflix. Uh, those are tools that have been used to read many feeds from all over the universe of media. So uh, the RSS feed. Do you know the RSS feed? So, uh, I'm used to, uh, to read really a lot of newspapers and uh, obviously motorbikes, and magazines, and jazz, but also Spider-Man comics, why not? And design uh, magazines, and food and living, etc. So, don't just avoid reading everything you can, interesting uh, ideas can, you know, just pop up from whenever and where you don't expect really. Uh, another, another way of, you know, uh, um, being more creative is avoiding our daily routine. We always wake up in the morning and we do the same thing in the same way every day. One of the training that I prefer is to wake up and just think about what I'm doing and do it in another way. It's really easy. Just, you know, the way you wear your trousers or the way you wash your feet. It's really simple, not just revolutionary things every day, but it, it will train your brain to the new. It will um, let your brain don't be lazy. So every day, just do a thing in a different way. If you just try it, yeah, if you go to your office every morning, just take different routes. I know actually it's, it's a kind of itinerary thing, you know, like you just uh, drop off the bus or the subway or whatever it's, you know, in your car, you park your car, then you start walking along the same path, bloody every day. Forget about it. 
there are plenty of different paths. And it's amazing how the, 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 the morning after you start, you know, um, forcing yourself to follow a different routine, which actually may end up in a routine itself, you feel better. You notice things that uh, up to the day before, you have forgotten about it. And it's very simple, it's very basic, but it's a very nice way to train your brain, especially because since yesterday, uh, scientists have proved that new brain cells can be developed during the lifetime. So actually the brain gets older, but the brain can also regenerate some of the cells by itself. It's proved by scientific evidence now. It's on nature since yesterday. I'm a pharmacist. On That's a big news actually. Yeah. It broke on the news yesterday from Nature uh, magazine. So it's kind of like a uh, science-based uh, assumption. And uh, that's very interesting. And routine actually makes, uh, plays a big role in uh, helping yourself uh, in getting older or staying younger. So the way you approach it makes a big difference. Just think about it. And the things that you are doing, that you are doing every day. You are doing every day the same thing in the same way. Even if I, I'm walking like this every time. <laughs> so, just avoid your daily routine. Uh, um, we are just, you know, um, clinging to the, our daily routine as a rock that we carry. Like, but, you know, just jump into the sea and, and live. I like it a lot. I like this place a lot. And the last thing that is really important when you are starting a new project, share your ideas with your team. It's really important. The, we use a lot of the words like brainstorming. Uh, meeting, etc. But um, just share your thoughts because uh, when you share your thoughts with other people, uh, all the all the good things appear, but also the bad things, the bad sides of your idea. You know, so it's really important because when you share things, you share knowledge and you create knowledge and your creativity. And, and the, the group can announce your creativity. So, uh, we are starting now. Barbara will introduce you uh, a concept uh, more uh, technical okay. uh, about design, about how, how we, keep, we can apply those ideas of creativity uh, to you. I would like to give you some, uh, um, well, let's say that we discuss together a few concepts. Uh, the title of the presentation is Death of the Inner Artist. Uh, is social media ruining credibility? Uh, I'm asking you, is social media ruining your own credibility? Do you feel that uh, by using social media, by being so technological or so digitally uh, involved, are you feeling like uh, losing something about yourself, uh, about your credibility? It's a question. Answer freely. Do you have this kind of perception? Do you feel less creative than no. you were 10 years ago? No. Well, actually, that's no. quite, uh, quite unusual because most of people would answer yes. There's a kind of... What's going on? A rough answer outside? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, but it looks like a party. So it's very creative. Okay. We might join them later on, maybe. Uh, the point is that many people actually in the last, uh, last few months, uh, well, a couple of years, have been uh, answering no. Actually, they feel like they're losing their credibility and they feel like social media is actually affecting somehow their way to be really in touch with themselves. Many people are complaining about the fact that being always on the social media um, is boosting their ego or maybe it's boosting their friends' ego. And so actually they are not uh, perceiving each other uh, as they properly are or as they probably should. Uh, the point is that uh, digital, uh, our digital life is not different from our real life. The point is that we perceive it in a way, it's all about perception. Because most of the people are talking about this problem, this issue, weren't born digital, they were born analog. Actually, we all were born analog. The majority of us. So, some of us are very young, so actually they were born, they are digital natives. Ah, but the other are not. You are. You are digital natives for sure. Definitely you are. <laughs> Mentally speaking, you are for sure. <laughs> The point is that being born analog makes us, uh, um, put us in the position to do continuously comparison between what it was before and what it's like nowadays. And this kind of comparison and jumping upside down and, and up and down from all the good different positions 
make can you still record in a proper way? Can you hear it? It's fine. Uh, uh, put us in a position which is kind of you know, like a borderline. Uh, uh, that's me. That's a very young and beautiful me. And I'm not putting up this feature just because I want to receive compliments. Just because uh, the whole aim of this presentation, of this workshop, workshop is about uh, to have you regain a little bit, a tiny bit uh, of your inner self. So be in touch again with your inner child. We really want you to feel again creative and free minder, free thinker, as you were when you were a child. You forgot about it. We all forgot about it. The point is that we have to get back to that kind of feeling. Of course, I mean, we will we'll be back at a rational level, not an emotional level, but still it's something. It's breaking the routine we were discussing before. Um, that's a definition about what we are nowadays. Deep thinkers, read between the lines, who analyze the world and digest it, and both the good and the bad. We are the words, other read every day. We post content, so we share content every day, so people are reading what we share. They are believing that they share. That's the thing. There's no filter anymore between us and the rest of the world. Uh, the color palette, the eyes so keen, the sounds in the red morning and night. They are constantly observing the world around us, yearning for inspiration, observation. Um, you think you are observing something. Most of the times we look and don't see. We hear, we don't listen. When we talk about participation, we all talk about uh, uh, cooperative design, meetings, brainstorming, sharing, and blah, blah, blah. The point is that we sit down in a meeting with a bunch of people just to tell what we want to tell, that just to be heard, and not to share, not to fully share. That, that's a major issue nowadays. We sit down in a, in a group uh, with people, and we don't want to really listen to what they have to say. We just want to state the point most of the time. That's not the way we are supposed to share and participate. That's something completely different, and it means something completely different. And as we gaze around, all we see in every direction is a glowing background. Yeah, there's a beautiful world out there. How can we go back to it? How can we make the best out of it? Creativity is here to tell the truth. That, that's the reality. That's the real truth. Being creative be, means being honest to ourselves, for example. We are surrounded by you know, inputs from social media. Uh, some people feel even overwhelmed. There are still people who are not on any social media, social network. There are still people proud and very proud to say, oh no, I'm not on Facebook. Look at this snobbish attitude now that we say. I'm not really, I don't really believe it's uh, still a pure and honest uh, um, assumption not being on social media. It's more like a kind of demonstration against uh, this overwhelming bunch of information we receive every day. Um, we are born analog and we have become digital, and that actually makes uh, uh, the difference I was talking to you about. An Asian an Asian proverb uh, says that it's better to see something once than to hear about it a thousand times. So it has, it's actually going back and taking us back to the fact that real life has to match digital life. Actually, they are the same thing. The point is that we keep dividing them into completely different environments and trying to live a world according to them. So we try to be digital sometimes and analog some of the times. There's no point in that. We have to be able to live freely and comfortably with both of them. Uh, what we are when we are digital? We are location-based. We are always traceable, traceable everywhere. Uh, we uh, are part of the transmedia storytelling, so our story is a story made up uh, on different social media channels. It could be video, it could be photo, it could be content. There are several different channels we are exposed to nowadays. Um, but at the same time, this, uh, um, this way of being might also be interesting because it enhances the experience. And if you take this one back to what the tourism, tourism experience, or the cultural experience could be, you understand the big potential behind it. That's another interesting uh, read. Um, it's a beautiful landscape, it's a beautiful sighting, and uh, uh, instead of having there an explanation, like traditional explanation of what you're watching at, like a beautiful canyon and blah, 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 you found this one. One minute, don't read, don't talk, no photo, just look and see. See. Feel it. What's missing there is feel it, but it's left up to you. So, again, uh, involve your inner self back. Be uh, emotional and rational as much as you can. Can I say, technology is a tool 
So we have to be an idea where we want to go. And then we can use one of the many tools that we have to reach that goal. So before taking a picture, think about how can I, what, can I, what, what should I say to this picture? That's the point. So the picture is, is true, actually. It says a thousand words, but still, those thousand words belong to you. It's your perception of the place. There are thousands, millions, billions of photos of the same item, or the same uh, iconic site. But the point is that every picture is different. Every person is different. Uh, nowadays, actually, there are more people dying of selfie than sharks. It's not a joke. It's a news from a, from a last week. Uh, last year, more people died trying to take selfies on themselves than uh, like because, of, because they are diving to the sharks. So can you understand what's going on in the world nowadays? What's going on to us? Okay, what's happening to us? Um, let's take it back to the travelers and the visitors and the destination management world. Uh, travelers nowadays, thanks to uh, social media, social outlets, they are zone. So we end up in a situation like this one. Like uh, everyone is thinking alike, and then it means probably somebody doesn't think anymore. So how often do you go traveling to a new destination and, and you find yourself in the position to, to have to go somewhere because everybody's been there. So you come to Rome, I'm from Rome, you have to, the must see, our port of Colosseum, the Fora, uh, private fountain, maybe the Pantheon, not always, and then the Vatican if you still have time. Uh, Rome has a very short uh, average stay time, which is the 2.6 nights, which is actually very, very, very short in such a large city. Because uh, people always follow the same path. And that's a big issue, also in terms of, um, let's say, um, sustainability of the uh, cultural heritage. And sustainability also in terms of um, relationship with the locals. I can't stand tourism anymore. I live right in the city center, along the path that goes from the traffic fountain to the fountain. It's the most, the European most beaten pedestrian track, most beaten pedestrian track in Europe. And it's not even 600 meters, and it's a nightmare. Every time I step out of my office, I'm taking my own, like thousands of tourists and carry to the phantom behind, well, really against my will. So, like, I can't avoid, I can't skip this huge bunch of people. And on Wednesday morning, when the Vatican and the Pope actually has the audience, the public audience, uh, to the, uh, the pilgrims, uh, we cannot step into the subway because the timing that children doesn't really comply with the time in the local for working. So Wednesday morning is not enough. Either you go out of town or you go up to work in the late. Otherwise, there's no way you can reach your office. No. We normally tend not to think about those things. But the point is that people tend to do uh, everything they've seen some other people doing before. We keep repeating patterns that have been designed by somebody else. And the same happens if when you, you go traveling and using, for instance, apps. Or you go to a museum and you open the museum up. Uh, who made the app? Someone thought that you might be interested in a specific uh, tour of the museum. Or someone thought that you might be interested in uh, visiting a specific uh, list of attractions and, and iconic items uh, in, in the urban uh, environment. But are we really sure we are so interested in all those items, in all those sites? I'm not. I mean, the first time I, uh, I go to a new city, whatever time I have, it might be a very short business trip or a longer stay, the first thing I do is jump in on a bus, whatever. I don't care where the bus is going. I sit down, it's very comfortable actually, and I go looking around and I get a first impression of the city. Then I made my mind and I say, okay, fine. I only have one day. I don't care about going to museums. I want to get the feeling of the city, so I just walk around. Maybe I have a longer time to stay, a longer, a longer chance to enjoy it, and then I pick a few iconic items. I went to Paris four times because I made it to the Louvre. And it was not just a chance, it was a plan of purpose. Because the, the, the first three times I went to Paris, I didn't have enough time to dedicate to the Louvre. So I say, forget it, I want to enjoy, I want to see what Paris looks like, what the French people are in Paris, what the Parisian uh, feeling is. So I forgot about the book and I forgot about all the other museums. I said, okay, fine. No. I sit in a cafe in a bistro and not there's some objects with a glass of champagne, which actually I think. You know, I want to feel like a Parisian person. But that's my perception. Uh, I'm working in the travel uh, business since 15 years, even a bit longer, and I never download an app to visit the city. I worked for a very famous blog, which is called Spotted by Locals, I'm one of the content providers, 
which made an amazing app for visiting cities, still, I have it on my phone and I have used it. When I go visit another city, I call one of the spotters living there and I get in touch with them and then I hang around with them. That's my way of approaching the city. So, uh, trying to uh, understand, what I'm trying to say is that uh, following paths which have been designed from uh, others for us that might be good, but doesn't really exhaust all the possibility you have. And that's where creativity actually finds space and room to get in. For instance, uh, if we leave all the power to the travelers as trip advisor or other um, amazing and very important uh, tools uh, have allowed to, we end up with those kind of situations, like uh, all those um, lists of ranking, like the most overrated city or uh, maybe the, um, the world's most underrated destination. So someone else is rating for us destination, which is good actually, it's, not, it's an interesting point of view, but still, it's fun point of view. It may be billions of, of reviews on TripAdvisor for hotels. Do you really follow all the reviews you read? I don't. I mean, I take a look at them, but then still, I want it to be my own decision. I want it to be my own mistake. If I book in the wrong hotel, fine. It's my own experience. It has to be mine. I'm still very interested in the reviews of people who stayed there before I do. But still, it has to be my own decision. I'm going to London for the 15th time in November. I put a new hotel I've never been in. And it's quite a risky thing because it's a room without any window. So I wanted to find it, to experience the, the feeling of being in a room with no windows on, the design hotel. Okay? Let's give it a try. And there were people like five nights on reviews like, oh my god, it's an horrible room. And some other were like, oh wow, that's really cool. I don't know what it's going to be like. It's going to be my own experience. That's not breaking the routine. Um, when you allow uh, someone else to completely judge, um, you rely on someone else's judgment uh, to make your own decision, you have to bear in mind that uh, things don't look the way you are expect expecting them to look most of the time. This is the um, this year um, country brand index. It's an analysis that's done a couple of years, every couple of years, every few years, from a Focus Right, which is a modern company, like a leading future brand, sorry. Future Brands, which is a, um, an important, very large firm, American firm, actually monitoring brand all over the world. Uh, would you say that Japan is the um, brand with the strongest position on the market? Would you say that? Would you say that Germany, with all the political things and all that, is the third most rated country, most rated brand in the world? No. Would you say that Italy is just a thing and there's no France in this ranking? But that's the way it is. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. We lost three positions, by the way, in two years. We were 15 two years ago, and we ended up being 18. Of course, I mean, that's a global ranking. If you go and um, watch the uh, tourism and cultural and lifestyle ranking, we, of course, I mean, rank up also first and second in some other, like the food and beverage, we are first and France is second. In a cultural heritage, we are first. In lifestyle, we are fourth. So it's still quite good for Italy. But the overall perception of the brand makes Japan Switzerland. Switzerland. No. Watches, chocolate, and cows. Switzerland is the second most rated brand. What does it mean? It means that whatever we think and we perceive doesn't really match reality most of the time. Again, an effort of you know, like creativity must be done. Because in this case, Italy is really like. Uh, like behind, it has to work a lot against the position. And actually, you have to consider why all the 17 countries in front of it have been behaving so well, so much better than actually the Italy itself is. If I tell you about Copenhagen, what's iconic to you about Copenhagen? Have you been to Copenhagen? How many of you? Okay. Uh, what's the most iconic thing, thing about Copenhagen that comes up to your mind? Mermaid, okay. Someone else? Cigarettes. Cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a okay. personal perception. Of That's a very personal perception, right. A vicious one, okay. What else? Bicycles? Bicycles. Lego, wow, that's good. Lego. Um, do you really link the, be honest, um, your, your complete, full perception of Copenhagen is just linked to physical attractions. So the mermaid is physical, the leg is also physical, but it's also not, it's something different. 
And if I tell you about London, what's your, um, the, the first iconic image that comes up to your mind? The Queen. So we say rock music, what else? Queen, the Queen, what else? Okay, the majority of people in the world would answer this one. Okay. Would answer about physical attraction. So, majority of people in the world has answered uh, a survey talking about London, say Buckingham Palace, the Queen, Westminster, Tower of London, London Eye. London Eye, actually, guys, yes. that water. That water, they like the most. Yeah, it's panoramic, so it's very good to make pictures. And, and people love it. So, it doesn't mean that the rest of it. I think it was it's still horrible along the, the same, but still, I mean, it, it works really well and it, and it gains a huge amount of money, so it's fine. The point is that, uh, um, notice the perception between Copenhagen and London. The perception the majority of people uh, have about Copenhagen is about lifestyle. Why I choose this picture? Because this one explains what Copenhagen is in a very nice day, by the way. Because the kind of weather doesn't happen that often in Copenhagen, to be honest. Uh, but it's like uh, people sitting in London house, having a beer, enjoying the, the time with no hurry, no, no rush. That makes uh, an idea of quality of life. Bicycles, that makes an idea of quality of life. Because bicycles are also in the Netherlands, uh, they're also in, uh, uh, in Germany a lot. But still, we link it to Copenhagen. Because for us, Copenhagen is a city where actually the point of life is really high. And you can take your own time to do things that you like. Some people in the survey even come up with, a, with an answer that was like a maternity living. Because we don't know that much about it. But the point is that Italy lags behind only Denmark in Europe. We are one of the best, um, actually the second best, European maternity living law in Europe. And it's just behind the Danish one. And that makes it also quite a lot. The idea of raising your children in Copenhagen makes everyone smile. Like lovely green fields and a very safe environment. You can carry your kids on the bike and there are bike lanes everywhere. If you think about Copenhagen, if you think about London, you think more about the active life. You say rock music, I would say fashion. Someone would say probably the Queen. Again, you know, it's very iconic. But still, it's very much linked to physical things. The perception about London is about huge property and it doesn't really match the idea of point of life, even though it's still very high to be such a large city. But then again, we go back to perception and it, it takes in involves so many personal aspects that we cannot really rely on someone else to say to us about it. And about pizza, it's too easy. Well, actually, they are supposed to tell us about a pizza later on. Oh, yeah, that's lovely. That's lovely. Do it for your mama. Do it, do, it for really your mama. do it for your mom. Actually, Denmark is still you know, has an interesting uh, childbirth rate, so I think it's a still quite decent country in the sense that they want to increase the children production, let's make it like that. And they pay you. And come back pregnant. And come back pregnant. Uh, that's a very interesting um, reverse point of view. Last uh, uh, March, I attended an event which is called Global Service Gem, which I, I recommend you. It's a free event, but you just pay for something like 25 euros uh, for the expenses, like uh, participating expenses, no more than that. It's held every year um, in uh, lots of cities around the world. Last year, we about 400 cities in the world. At the same time, it's a weekend, it starts on a Friday night and it ends up on a uh, Sunday afternoon. And it's a very intensive 48 hours idea generation session. People from different backgrounds, so designer, marketing, uh, whatever, humanistic and technological backgrounds, gather to uh, work on a lab, a guided uh, workshop, about generating new ideas, service ideas. They can come up with the most diverse things, from medical assistance to tourism to political things, really, just an amazing session. I would warmly recommend you to participate, because it's an highly um, say, rewarding experience. Absolutely. Uh, I attended the one in Rotterdam because uh, in the Netherlands because uh, well, I have strong personal connections there, but still I like the idea that uh, the Netherlands are quite strong on service design thinking approach. So I thought that I might find uh, uh, I might found a better um, let's say, suggestions and, and, and uh, inspiration up there. But it was also held in Milano, in Palermo, in Bologna, for instance. And every city actually can organize one, so to make even old one in Pisa next year if you like. Uh, what happened? It happened that one of the team, and that was the winning team, came up with a tourist uh, idea, a tourist service. They are all people living, residents in Holland. They weren't all Dutch, but they were all residents in Holland. What's the most iconic feature in Rotterdam? 
of the studies. The first one is the post, and the second one is the wind. All over the time. Wind is really strong in the Netherlands. It's really annoying, it's pain in the Netherlands. And uh, what happens when you have lots of wind? The Dutch can still uh, cycle, I mean, they do whatever the weather. The tourists don't do that much. Whilst we were uh, old in the jam, the wind gets really strong and strong. So even the Dutch couldn't cycle anymore. It's really like it's too complicated. They couldn't stand in the street. You have to walk along with them and the walls. It was really complicated. They came up with this idea. They say, okay, we used to travel with us. We used to follow the, the given track, you know, like someone else decided for us. Let's make something different. So let's reverse think about it. Um, let's make uh, the place, the destination, to decide which way he, needs, he wants to be explored. And it's okay, let's pick the wind as the decision maker. So it's okay, rent a bike, open up your app, the app will feel the wind, with the sensor in the phone, actually, the phone, so the smartphone can already register where the wind is coming from, and he will guide you through the uh, GPS along a path which may show you something about what you done which is completely unexpected. It could be, every time, very different. It depends on the wind. So you rent your bike, and then you go to the floor. And I found this, this idea absolutely amazing. Actually, they won the contest. There's a contest within the time. They won the contest. And I thought it was really cool. And, uh, and it wasn't by chance that two other people in the team were service designers, so were trained to think about creativity in a different way. And, uh, and we are also thinking, we are actually joining the team afterwards, about implementing the app. One of the few apps worth probably downloading your phone. Because it might be the wind, it might be something else in a different destination. It might be whatever is very characteristic to the destination. It might be locals. For instance, in some, uh, in some Greek islands uh, years ago, when this was uh, touristic but less developed in the sense than it is nowadays, um, when you drop off at the port so in small islands, you find plenty of locals trying to, you know, like to uh, beg you to rent a room in their house or to rent their own boat and all that. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of power in the locals. Uh, why not following the locals in his daily life? But on a real basis, like, you know, like unexpected. So whoever I found, uh, whoever I find, I meet in the port, might be my guide. It's not something we decided before. It's, something, it's a matchmaking done in real time. That makes a difference. So if I actually agree with someone before arriving at the destination, that person is already thinking about the path we may follow, and okay, we can go there, and we can go there. No way. Because it's going to be the local part, and not the tourist part. I mean, all tourists, uh, it's very fashionable, I would say, that we want to live like locals. Yeah, but the locals live their own life. A tourist who lives the local life doesn't live an experience. He lives the local experience. And again, it's not, a, it's not your own experience. So we have to reverse that process. Let's define experience now. So experience is about making choices, okay, and taking the responsibility for the choice you make. So that's when we regain power and control over our own tourist experience, cultural experience, and the own experience. But creativity, as we said before, is lacking in those days. How do we get it back? Uh, what are uh, the ma major dangers about, the major killers of creativity nowadays? I'll show you a thing. Who killed creativity? I, I love this picture. I have to put it in. So it's really not needed, but I have to put it in. I think it's really cool. And he explains much better than many words. You understand? Yeah. The guy's done. Um, yeah. yeah, we can skip this one. Oh, that's the idea of um, creativity we need to fight. Uh, we keep being taught how to think. We keep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I put on my shirt. Uh, we keep being taught uh, how to think, how to behave, how to perform. But the point is that, again, we need some guidance. But guidance is to be meant to help ourselves to develop our own skills, not the other way around. So, creativity killer number one, the control cure. Everybody who tries to control the situation is killing creativity. Of course, guidance is needed, but just guidance, not control. Creativity killer profile number two, fear. We are afraid of trying on new things. She was trying on people's. I mean, it's kind of your... Uh, Friday, right on people. I lived in Trento, you know that, and I didn't never, I never changed my um, my tires on my car, so I didn't put on the winter ones. And then one night it knew a lot, and I had to go up to the hills to get to the office. And I said, okay, you know, I can. It doesn't snow that much. I can still make it. You wouldn't tell what happened that morning. You know, it's probably the most frightening experience I've had in my life. 
I had to drive for five kilometers on a very slippery, slippery hill with a car which wasn't fit for that. So we kind of flat tire as well. And with no chance to break in, because I couldn't use the brakes, no way. You know, like I, I ended up in the office and I was sweating like hell, and it was jammed. I was, I, I was the most scary experience of my life, never ever. So I know that to try these new things, I have to train myself first and change by a few. Creativity killer number three, the pressure pack. Under pressure, we can do nice things if we are the kind of people who can stand pressure. Some of us cannot stand pressure, so get, you know, make peace with that. If you cannot stand pressure, be self-aware and try to organize yourself in order to make sure that pressure doesn't affect your career. Killer number four, insulation click. Uh, the click is, uh, can be translated like cricca in Italian, so the, the club. Uh, it happens very often in uh, um, structure organizations. So you have a team of colleagues uh, who try to narrow it down, to, down, uh, to um, you know, this kind of tendency tendent, a friend to mediocrity, like that. they want you to be like they are, but you don't feel like it. So try to stay away from that kind of circle, because so that's really bad. Because you feel like you need to belong to the circle to be accepted. No way. I mean, you won't, you won't get accepted anyway. They feel the difference, so they will keep you at bay for the time anyway. So, uh, much better to be creative. Just say, don't be so excited. Yeah. Just do, you know, yeah, like the best you can do. Yeah. To, yeah. To, yeah. Just do Why do you stress so much? Oh, why are you always so passionate about this? Because I'm a passionate person. If you can stand it, it's your problem, it's not mine. You know, I can handle my own excitement. If you can't handle my own excitement, I'm not asking you too. Like, it's tough to do. It's your business. I know it's not very Italian, but we have to implement a new model. Have you killer number five? The upper group. Again, go back to structural organization. How many of you do have uh, Kill them. Number six, the narrow mind. And I don't have to say anything about that. And number seven, the pessimism. It's never going to change. We always done like that. The four words that ruins any business. We always done like that. No way. Having done something in the same way for 10 years doesn't mean you cannot change it today. Actually, it means right, you have to change it straight away. That's the problem. Okay, so we are done. So go get it back, which means go, let's get to the country back. We are going to all the, yeah. Bam, bam, bam. We are going to hold a very, uh, very creative session now. So you're going to make something. Uh, what time now? So we still have a few minutes to talk about the design. We have a lot of time. We can make it. I see the slides because I think maybe we can start with slides. And just tell you a few um, highlights about service design. Service design thinking or design thinking is a methodology uh, born about 20 years ago and is actually muted by the product design. When you design a product, what do you do? You observe reality, you notice that there's some uh, needs or some necessity uh, rising, you research about it, then you prototype a solution. You come up with a solution that you, put, you physically prototype. It may, it may be a chair, it may be a wheelchair, it may be a, um, let's say, like the porta pigole, like among for patients who are you know, like chronic patients who used to take medicines every day and they need some specific box to keep all the pills in. It might be whatever, you know, like product design, whatever product. Then you implement the product, you put it on the market, and you test it. And it comes back to you, a feedback, which you might work on. It happens with cars, for instance, automotive market. Cars are never designed uh, to stay the same. Uh, how often happens you to say, oh yeah, I bought that Fiat, but I bought it, it was the first release, that's why I got that problem. They fixed it in the second release. That's what always happens. They put a car on the market, they observe what the customers, uh, what kind of use the customer made of the car, they come up with feedback and they fix a few things. I bought a Twingo, there were no Twingo years ago, and the, um, say the SOS uh, button was put in a position which actually required you to lean over um, to push it on. And uh, probably they thought, okay, when you break down immediately, very quickly, you are forced to go there with your hands. But sometimes you use it also when you are not in an emergency. And that was really uncomfortable. It forced you to move in a position which was actually not very safe. Many people notified that to Renault. The second release of the car put the bus to somewhere else. That was happened with product service. Why don't we do the same with services? 
with traditional services, like with the intangible services? Why we put something on the market and we never pay attention to it? Uh, how many times it happened to you to have been in touch with the call center of the provider? It could be the telephone company, it could be the, like, the energy company. Uh, how was your experience on average? You can tell us for fact. You've been left probably wrong for ages. And then you mentioned the line a lot. And uh, maybe someone answered, but if it wasn't the proper office, they weren't in charge for it. And you weren't supposed to call. Maybe they were nice, but they couldn't fix the problem. And they left a message for another operator. And the next time you call, the operator couldn't find the message that the one was going on and that. So it's very complicated. Because no one pay attention to services. So product design is being uh, modified to this service design. Okay? And now we design service with the same uh, mindset. So we design service observing reality, um, understanding needs, prototyping even physically you know, the service. Like, uh, let's provide the desk. If we think that uh, the information, the tourist information point of the train station, must be also a physical information point. Let's prototype it, so let's speed it up, let's put there a person, let's uh, um, make video that should feature or what the tourists uh, do when they approach the desk. Let's record what happens for a few days, let's extract data, analyze the data out of it, and then let's implement the service. Let's approach the expert. And that's actually the mindset I would like uh, to disseminate around. That's the mindset. It's not very complicated, it's common sense. It's basic stuff. But we can do that. So let's try to get it back to the methodology. Uh, we are trying to, um, well, pass through a few concepts about it. By a very simple exercise. We would like you to create a storytelling. The service design has many different tools you might use. Uh, there are storytellings, there are personas, there are storyboards, and many others. The persona is a concept, a concept which is about the Archetypal, uh, no, archetypal, 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 let's use the Greek word, archetypal of a customer. So let's try to um, imagine what the customer can carry with him. What kind of expectations, needs, uh, information he might need us to provide. Okay, what kind of service we might to develop around uh, that person. So we would like you to do that with some images, an ecology, an ecology image.